OK, this presentation was first given to the South East Homeless Network on the 16th of July 2020 and was updated and recorded on 13th of August 2020. Thanks, Alan and Adam. OK, and we'll start by doing introductions. So my name is Alan Noble and I'm a Development Manager at Portsmouth City Council Public Health Team. Um, my name is Adam Hollands. I'm a public health registrar and um, I was involved a little bit with the organisation in the event, but I can't claim too much credit. Um, Alan and everyone else involved did a fantastic job getting it off the ground so quickly. Um, and I'm here today just to talk a little bit about hepatitis C and tuberculosis and the results and what they mean. OK, so if we can have the next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about um, the situation prior to us undertaking the screening work that we did. So um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic in Portsmouth, there was a mixture of hostel and night shelter accommodation for rough sleepers. Um, we had around 57 people who would be in night shelters using them each night. There were 57 beds. And then there still were approximately 23 people sleeping rough on the streets. Due to the pandemic and the kind of government's instruction to get everyone in, um, on the 1st of April, we moved 80 people into one particular hotel, which is the, the hotel on the left, the Ibis Budget Hotel, the picture on the left. Um, but the numbers have kind of grown rapidly um, and a second hotel was brought online, which is the hotel on the right, Ibis, um, Ibis Red, we call it, because it's got a red sign. The other one has a blue and it differentiates their budget and their sort of nicer hotels. So currently there are over 200 people residing in two hotels within the city um, and have been doing so since sort of early May onwards. Next slide. So the fact that we had so many people and such a concentration of vulnerable and complex individuals within well, effectively two sites, whilst it created very significant challenges, mainly in terms of managing the behaviours of having over 100 people in one building um, with all sorts of complex issues, um, it also provided huge, huge opportunities for us in public health and our NHS and public sector partners to reach out to these individuals and do some proactive work. So some of the examples of work we've done in Portsmouth since April, um, we've had a homeless healthcare team which has been based and delivering clinics within the hotels. We've started a vaping um, starter kit project where we were providing free vaping kits and um, liquids to smokers in the project in the hotels um, and then that kind of dealt with some of the management issues because they weren't allowed smoking in their rooms but obviously had some very positive health benefits too and we've managed to get people to quit smoking as a result of of that work and then of course the opportunity to to screen for infectious diseases so i'll kind of have the next slide so um although People moved into the hotels at the beginning of April and the numbers grew through and two hotels were full in May. It wasn't until the beginning of June that I, I suddenly had a bit of a, a light bulb, uh, light striking moment and thought, oh, why didn't I think of this sooner? We should be doing screening for, for people in these hotels um, for infectious, um, for well, not necessarily COVID, but for other infectious diseases such as TB and bloodborne viruses. Um, so if I go to the next slide. So as of um, the 3rd of June, I made initial contact with stakeholders, including Public Health England's South East Region team, Portsmouth Hospitals NHS Trust, um, and particularly their hepatology and respiratory departments. And the 10th of June, we had a virtual meeting, again with a range of partners, and that was organised by the Public Health England local team. Um, and there was a really positive response from all parties wanting to work together and to make it happen. But we were time pressured because at the time we thought the, the contracts on the hotels were only to the end of July. Um, so we knew we had to get this delivered fairly quickly. Um, so I was able to get some funding approved um, through the public health t um, service at Portsmouth City Council. And we raised the contract and got the purchase order signed, got it all, all that aspects of it done quite quickly. And then we delivered the initial um, screening in the two hotels on the 29th and 30th of June. So it was quite a rapid turnaround from initial concept through to delivery. But it was the 
real proactive engagement and the kind of positive positivity of partners to want it to make it happen that meant that meant it did happen and the hotels have been um, visited subsequently by hepatology and um, respiratory specialist nurses um, later in July next slide <coughs> so just so in terms of the screening that we did um, initially back in June the partners that we had in place on site delivering the screening engaging with uh, the residents there picking up any sort of support needs and engaging people in peer support were Portsmouth Hospitals Trust and the, the kind of clinical specialisms there Oxford Immunitech who had taken the bloods literally and, and doing the TB testing um, homeless healthcare team the hepatitis C trust when that's providing peer support our Portsmouth um, the recovery hub which is a substance misuse treatment engagement service and our um, pushing change which is a peer-led organization in the city that works with people within substance misuse and indeed on day on the day we had really positive really good support from our housing support providers who were running the hotels and next slide I'll hand over to Adam hello um so I don't know if it's worth saying something very quickly about screening uh, I'm not sure who might be watching this or might be uh, preaching to the choir um but the reason that we do screening um is some diseases including hepatitis C and tuberculosis have an early stage um, where um, patients might be asymptomatic. They might not know that they have the infection, um, but we can detect it. So we can get in there early and treat it before it goes on to develop into a more serious disease that causes them significant problems or potentially even leads to death um, and can also reduce ongoing infection to other people by treating it at that early stage. Um, so on the day, um, bloodborne viruses were tested for hepatitis C, hepatitis B and HIV. Um, and tuberculosis was tested for as well and um, people could also have an ultrasound scan of their liver to see if they had liver fibrosis where the liver goes hard um, and stops working um, which can be caused by different infections and other things. Um, so first of all hepatitis C, um, so it's a virus um, that is bloodborne so it's spread through things like sexual intercourse and through sharing needles um, if people um, inject drugs. Um, it can affect the liver um, and can lead to um, liver cirrhosis or fibrosis where the liver goes hard and stops working as I said, um, liver failure, cancer and ultimately death and it can also affect lots of other areas of the body. Um, if you have chronic hepatitis C you can be completely asymptomatic and not know that you have it but that can go on to develop into a more serious infection and during that time you're infectious to other people. Um, about a decade ago hepatitis C was very difficult to treat um, but advances in treatment have meant that now much more optimistic um, targets have become realistic in terms of trying to reduce the burden of hepatitis C and potentially even eliminate it. So the UK is committed to an 80% reduction in hepatitis C incidence, which is the um, amount of new cases, and a 65% reduction in mortality related to hepatitis C by 2030. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, a significant amount of people are thought to have hepatitis C with about 90,000 in England estimated to have chronic hep C in 2019. And um, have the next slide, please. Um, so this diagram, just uh, probably laboring the point, but just um, shows how hepatitis, the sort of natural history of hepatitis C. So if you develop an acute infection, you can spontaneously clear the infection um, without any medical intervention, or you can go on to develop a chronic infection during which point you're infectious and you can go on to have these more um, serious um, sequelae of the disease. Um, so a little caveat here, I'm waiting for some clarification from the nurses about the numbers tested. So this might be one or two out, but um, we think 60 um, were tested for hepatitis C on the day um, and sorry, the two weeks later follow up. So I think they got one additional person at that point um, of those 60 who were tested overall. Um, about one in four were hepatitis C RNA positive. Um, RNA is like the genetic building block of the virus. Um, that means that those 16 people at some point have been exposed to hepatitis C. They might have fought it off or they might have a chronic infection. Of those, um, uh, 
Oh no, sorry. Um, sorry, those 16, sorry, were antibody positive, not RNA positive. Um, so that means they were exposed to the disease. Of those 10 were RNA positive, which means that they have active infection at the moment. Um, so those 10 have been offered treatment and the six who are antibody positive um, and um, RNA negative will hopefully at some point be retested just to check that they don't have active infection. Um, of the 10 who have active infection, five have already started on treatment about a week ago. Um, uh, three have moved on, one to rehab and two to um, have left the hotel. Um, but hopefully at some point in the future, they will be followed up. One's going to be started on treatment in about a week and one unfortunately declined treatment. Um, could I have the next slide please? So then TB. Um, TB is bacteria, um, typically affects the lungs, um, and if it affects the lungs and the upper airway is an active infection, then it's infectious for other people because people cough out droplets of the bacteria. Um, but it can also affect lots of other parts of the body and um, present in very different ways. Many people develop latent TB, um, which means they have the bacteria in their body, but it's not currently an active infection. So they're not act actively in, um, infectious to other people, and it's not causing them any problems. But at any point in the future, they might go on to develop an active infection and potentially become infectious. Um, so people with latent TB um, can be more easily treated. It requires less drugs and less time um, to prevent um, that happening in the future. Um, like hepatitis C, uh, the UK has very um, ambitious targets, um, trying to reduce the um, incidence of TB by 90% by 2035. Um, and it's not as prevalent as, as hepatitis C, but there are still a significant amount of people in the UK with the disease, um, and about 4,500 were notified as having TB in 2018. Have the next slide, please. Um, so again, potentially laboring the point, but this is the natural history of TB. So if you're exposed, um, you might just fight it off and not develop an infection. You could go on straight away to develop an active infection, which if it's in the airways means you're infectious, um, or it could be somewhere else in the body, or you could develop latent TB and then potentially later on go on to develop an active infection. And that green shaded area is the area that we can get in and treat them before they go on to develop serious complications or infect other people. Um, so including um, the three, I believe, who were tested at the two week follow up event, um, there uh, were 62 who were tested for TB. Of those four had an indeterminate result um, or borderline result, which means they required a retest to, um, to double check that result. One of those has already been retested and were negative and two were positive. Um, so those two that were positive, that means they have either latent or active TB. Um, and they will hopefully be offered um, further investigations to see if they have an active infection and treatment as appropriate for either latent or active TB. Um, I believe we haven't, um, that they haven't had those investigations yet, but hopefully that will happen at some point in the future. Um, if I have the next slide, please. Um, so um, in terms of the other investigations, so nobody was identified to have hepatitis B or HIV, um, which is obviously great and a weight off their mind. Um, and the fibro scans, so fibro scans are a rapid ultrasound scan that looks to see if there's liver fibrosis of any cause um, that could be related to hepatitis or something else. Um, and those four um, are hopefully going to be offered follow up appointments with hepatology for further investigations and treatment as appropriate. Um, next slide, please. And back to Alan. OK, so this is just to summarise some of the initial learning that we've taken from the the events, um, although Adam is working on a more detailed evaluation. So a, a site visit by key partners beforehand would have been beneficial, especially for the IBIS Blue, which was the budget IBIS. Um, when we got there, it, the space was very small. We had to use essentially what were two bedrooms in order to work out of. And um, we would have um, it would have been better if we were better prepared for what we were letting ourselves in for. Social distancing was very very difficult and challenging within that building because of the small communal spaces and the very narrow corridors um, in terms of incentives we did provide some incentives to us the participants but they were basically just a can of coke and a and a chocolate bar actually i think we in retrospect thinking about it better incentives would have probably encouraged more to test particularly if it had been in a cash or voucher form um, then 
the take take up would likely have been higher. Um, we just didn't have the time to be able to get all of that that processed um, to be able to do that. Um, particularly with Ibis Blue, we probably had too many staff on site. So whilst we were, it was excellent to engage so many different partners and peer mentors within the the work. Actually, the building was too small to accommodate so many people, and uh, we could have perhaps had a few less, um, which would have meant we were, weren't struggling so much with socially to social distancing. It wasn't so much of an issue in the Ibis Red because there was a large reception and foyer area um, and and separate rooms, uh, meeting rooms that we could use. Um, so in, t in, in conclusion, we, we could have managed the numbers. We actually tested probably with just the nursing staff and this would have further reduced the costs because we hired in a company, Oxford Immunitech, to take the bloods and to do the TB testing. The BBV testing was done within the hospital labs, um, but because of the numbers we actually had, we could have done it at a lower cost. Um, having said that, if we'd had 100 people, 150 people that we tested, we would have absolutely struggled with the nurses. Next slide. So in terms of next steps, um, our specialist nurses will be working to test um, the residents of the hostel. Um, we've got a homeless hostel in the city that has 32 beds. So the work that we've done within the hotels will be mirrored within the hostel to be able to see if we can pick up some further um, cases of TB or bloodborne viruses. Um, there's a, an evaluation which is being completed by Adam. Um, that's in progress and that I assume will be published at some point. Um, the link, um, essentially what we're going to seek to try and do now in future is to link ongoing testing for TB and bloodborne viruses within the work of our homeless healthcare team so that there's regular monthly clinics supported by hepatology and respiratory specialist nurses that will make this part of routine day-to-day -day work rather than um, a big one-off splash. Um, so yeah, we've been able to do a, a bigger um, session. We've picked up some cases, which is really, really good, and we're able to you know, providing treatment to people, potentially life-saving. Um, but it needs to become part of our more normalised day-to-day work in future. Next slide. And it's just references. Any questions? Yes, we've just got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, you talked about working with other agencies. Was that, was a group in place or did you have to forge those relationships from scratch? Um, there wasn't a group in place formally, but the relationships weren't forged from scratch because we had them anyway. We had already, through my work as substance misuse lead for public health team within Portsmouth, I had links with those teams within the hospital trust and I've also undertaken some work with homeless previously and um, helped set up the homeless healthcare team. So I already had developed links with the TB, the respiratory team and the BBB team. Um, so I was able to call on those, able to call on links that were, um, were I'd had with Public Health England and everyone was just so positive to want to do something and work together to make it happen. That it was just more about how we made it happen rather than if we made it happen. Um, so it was pushing an open door really, which was really, really, a really positive experience. Great. And just one other question. Um, you talked about some people that didn't want to take up the offer of treatment. Were there reasons given or for that decision? Um, that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not sure about the one person that um, actually definitively refused the treatment. Um, three, it's just it was. Um, sorry, that that was for hepatitis C. And the three who have moved on, um, that's just been logistics. But um, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure. I haven't spoken to the nurses, but I would imagine there are some attempts underway to to follow that up. Um, I think there was. Um, limited engagement um, by some of those who were tested in terms of getting their results, um, which is obviously something to think about in the future, how we could encourage that engagement. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is obviously the on ongoing um, treatment and making sure that they, they do complete it. 
Um, so one one way that the hepatitis nurses have been um, uh, confronting that is by providing a whole course of treatment of hepatitis C um, to the people who tested positive that want to be treated rather than having to have additional clinic appointments which may have uh, um, additional challenges in terms of engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really exciting piece of work. Thanks.